Carol and I have been married for 16 mostly wonderful years. We have a lovely 14-year-old daughter named Jenny. Initially, we wanted another child, but Carol went on the pill right away and we both got involved with our jobs. We were so happy with Jenny that eventually, we felt we didn't need another child. I love my family so much and thought we had created a loving marriage and a close relationship. I've always felt lucky to have an intelligent, attractive wife, but sometimes I wonder if having such a pretty wife would lead to some difficulty. I was always amazed and delighted that such a beautiful woman decided to marry an average-looking stiff like me. Whenever I brought this up, Carol would laugh. I guess I just felt sorry for you, Mark. You looked so dejected when I met you that first time, I just had to cheer you up, she'd say. Well, you sure did a great job at that, I'd reply, smiling. After I met you, I've never felt dejected again. I love you. I love you too, Mark. That teasing banter always got a big laugh from both of us. But lately, I've been thinking seriously about her answer. She was correct, I was depressed when Carol and I first met. I had just broken up with my longtime girlfriend from college. Yeah, I was dumped. I cared for her a lot. When she wanted to break up, I was very down in the dumps. We had been together for three years, and the breakup hit me hard. I found out later she met another guy from her hometown and wanted to pursue a relationship with him. There was no cheating involved, she always said she had fun with me when we were together, but she was soon leaving the area to return home and didn't want to maintain a long-distance relationship. In fact, she had met this guy a couple of months before during a break in her classes. She said they hadn't had sex, but she was interested and decided to break up before cheating on me. I guess I respected her for being honest, although it still hurt. Before I met Carol, I finished college with an accounting degree, got a job right away, and started my career as a single man. I dated a few girls but never met anyone I really cared for. My sex life was infrequent, none of the women from work turned me on. I partied with some friends after work, but my career was my life, and in a couple of years, I was making pretty good money. It was by chance that I met my future wife. I was invited to a friend's house for a party. My friend Jim Simpson, whom I've known since my college partying days, and his wife Martha kept trying to set me up a few times with some eligible females. It was at one of these house parties that I met Carol. She was introduced to me at the party, and we hit it off. Carol's a tall, vivacious natural blonde with a pretty face and a slender but shapely figure. Jim pointed her out and said she, like me, had broken up with her boyfriend and was available. She was so pretty that I found it hard to believe why any guy in his right mind would break up with such a beautiful woman like her. Carol was pleasant and told me she's an art major and was graduating soon. She was not only beautiful and intelligent but funny, outgoing, and very easy to talk to. We ended up chatting for most of the party. She agreed to meet me the next weekend, and we began dating soon. We had sex and became an item. Not long afterward, we were a couple. At first, Carol made it clear she was still dating other guys, but after a few months, we became exclusive. At least, I was. It took her a little longer before I knew she had only eyes for me. I was already a CPA when I met Carol and established in my career. I think the fact that I was making good money and could afford to take Carol to places her previous boyfriends never could was a big factor in her decision to marry me. I know being financially stable was important to her, and when I showed her my new home, my sports car, and took her to nice restaurants, she was impressed. I'd like to think it was my good looks and charm that attracted her, but being honest, I knew that I was only average looking and kind of reserved, certainly not a stud. I believe she enjoyed our lovemaking, I know I did. I found out she was a lot more sexually experienced than I and had dated a lot of guys before me. In my mind, once we were married, it was forever, and those guys were history. She told me they were in her past, that she loved me and only me. I accepted her answer completely, and not long afterward, I asked her to marry me. When she said yes, it was the happiest day of my life. Jim Simpson had been a friend of mine for years. We played on a few sports teams and partied together. We lived in the same town and met up regularly to drink and hang out. Jim was married at the time, but when his marriage to Martha began to fail, I tried to help him get over his divorce. I found out later that he had been cheating on Martha and she found out about it. 
she hired a shark of a lawyer and took my best friend to the cleaners. Jim's a handsome guy, loud, and bigger than me. Once he was single, we went out together, and I could see that women were attracted to him. He dated some really sexy chicks, even bringing them over to our house for parties and dinners. None of his relationships lasted longer than a few months. Carol and I talked about his problems, and she was the one who pushed me to keep inviting him over to our house. She kept telling me that Jim was down in the dumps about his life and needed our support. That didn't seem to fit because I knew for a fact that he didn't need any help to get dates. Carol was insistent that we remain good friends and help him get over the bad memories of his divorce. I often told Carol she didn't need to worry about him so much. I didn't want to unfairly characterize my friend, so I never mentioned that he was a liar, a cheater, and probably deserved the divorce. I brought up that Jim was a good-looking single guy with a well-paying job and told her how women seemed to flock to him everywhere we went. She disagreed. Carol said he just hid his depression about his failed marriage, that he was our friend, and we couldn't let him down. I guess I just went along with her opinion and kept up our friendship, he was my best friend for years, and the truth is, I was happy to have him around. That was the situation for a number of years. However, in the last few months, things began to change. As usual, Jim came around quite often, and as had been the case for some time, Carol increasingly kept bringing up his supposedly fragile emotional condition. It was strange because Jim didn't seem depressed at all. But she'd been like this for so long I considered it a normal topic of conversation. However, when things grew even stranger around our house, I became suspicious. I was working harder than ever as an accountant, but over the last couple of years, my career had stagnated. I hadn't gotten the promotion I deserved. I still had a number of important clients and was still making decent money, and I was still providing Carol and Jenny with a good living. Carol was also working part-time at an art studio, making a small income, so our finances, while not improving too much, were still on sound footing. The problem was that after 10 years at my firm, I wasn't making the money I thought I should, considering the long hours I had to put in. I hoped for another raise to make up the shortfall, but when the economy took a downturn, upper management decided to have a series of layoffs. I kept my job, but my salary was cut. Luckily, Carol was still working, and her lifestyle at the time was pretty conservative. The problem arose when I told my wife we'd have to cut our expenses. When I informed her that we'd have to cancel our annual vacation, she was shocked. I explained the situation and told her that, in addition to cutting our vacation, we'd have to cut back on a few other luxuries, such as going out so often. At the time, we usually went out every weekend to dinner, dancing, or to a show. Carol didn't understand why, after working so many years, our finances were in such a bad state. I went on to explain to my dubious spouse that my income had dropped and my prospects for a promotion in the short term were not good. Carol had always enjoyed an active social life. She had lots of friends, some of whom were rather snobby. She loved to dress up and enjoyed attending expensive social engagements. In the past, I reluctantly went along with her wishes when she'd accept invitations to some gala. But with my diminished income, the rather large mortgage, the car payments, and my responsibilities to our daughter's education fund, we had to cut back somewhere. Carol was not pleased when I informed her that we could no longer maintain our lucrative lifestyle. She was flabbergasted when I suggested canceling going to some of the expensive restaurants with her friends. Of course, that conversation led to an argument and eventually a big fight over our future. At first, I didn't think it was unusual when my friend Jim was around during some of these arguments. He was coming over to our house several times a week at the time, so it was inevitable he'd witness some of these discussions. It was rather awkward when he seemed to favor Carol's side of the argument. He wasn't obvious about it, as Carol and I would discuss our issues, he listened for a bit then offered an occasional comment, which on the surface seemed conciliatory. But when I thought about it later, he seemed to always agree with Carol. When I brought up canceling outings with our friends, Carol turned to Jim and asked how he felt about it. The big guy would act thoughtful, but eventually would agree with Carol. He would reiterate her arguments and even offer to help us out with our finances if needed. I didn't like that answer. He went on to offer to drive if we wanted to go out somewhere. If Carol and I wanted to go to a club that had a cover charge, Jim even offered to pay whatever fee was required. 
If we were invited to a party, he'd pay for some sort of gift if necessary so we wouldn't have to go empty-handed. I thanked him but said no thanks. I want to make my wife happy, but I was irritated that he always offered to come to our financial rescue. I knew he could afford to help us out. He had left his previous job and was now working in some sales job, apparently doing quite well. One evening, Carol invited Jim over for dinner without telling me, which happened quite regularly now. As usual, she was a great hostess. We enjoyed pleasant conversation as we finished the delicious dinner Carol cooked. After our daughter left to do her homework, we retired to the living room and opened a bottle of wine. We barely poured our wine and sat down before Carol reminded me of the upcoming annual charity event I'd forgotten about. Although it was something we attended every year, I listened to her telling how many of our friends would be there and how nice the event was. I already knew about this event and also how much it would cost to get in. When I explained that we couldn't afford any sort of party this month, Jim suddenly spoke up. He said he understood my reluctance but that this event was for charity and it would be a shame not to contribute in some way. Carol eagerly listened to him with a look of delight on her face. When my friend offered to assist us with the cost, Carol was elated. I, however, was pissed. He was well aware of our financial situation and my feelings on the subject. I guess I expected my best friend to support my decision, but that wasn't the case. Carol listened silently to my objections, then she shot me a glare and glanced over at Jim. They shared a look that immediately raised my suspicions. Come on, Mark, Jim said pointedly. You know this is an annual event and one that we've never missed. It'd be a shame not to go over just a few bucks. We've been going for years. I was also disappointed, but I knew that we needed to keep our expenses down so we could afford the large mortgage payment that month. We just have to go, sweetheart, Carol insisted, patting my hand. I know it will be a little tight, but everyone we know will be there. Jim chipped in, you know, the guys would love to see you, Mark. I know they're all looking forward to it. It'll be a blast. Before I could reply, Carol squealed. We had so much fun last year, remember, honey? I shook my head no, and Carol scowled with a determined glare. She said, I'm serious, Mark. We have to go, honey. All our friends will be there, and I've already spoken to Mary, and I don't want them to think that we don't contribute to charity. Everyone wants to give to charity, but I was thinking that if we don't get our finances together, we'll be the ones that have to accept charity. It's just not in the budget this year. I told them flat out, maybe next year, but it'll be a blast, Jim said, smiling. Of course it will, Carol said. She pouted and turned to Jim. But darn it, Mark just doesn't want to go. Jim questioned my decision again, before I could answer my wife began to complain about how cheap I was. Nothing she said was a secret, I had been holding back on some of our expenditures. She turned her attention to Jim and listed several times she couldn't do what she wanted because I refused. You see, Jim, she said to him, ignoring me, I'm trying to enjoy a great social life, but Mark's not letting me. He's getting cheap in his old age. Carol made me sound like a disagreeable old man. I tried to reply calmly, but it was difficult. I'm not cheap, Carol, just realistic despite what you think. We're in a bit of a slump, spending money we don't have is just stupid in our situation. I don't want us to overextend ourselves. But think of all the good that we can contribute, honey, Jim quickly added. You know it's a charity event, right, Mark? Of course, I do. I exclaimed in exasperation, but it's $75 a plate, then there's the parking fee at the club, and after an expensive dinner that we can't afford, there's the charity auction we'll be expected to bid on overpriced items that we'll never use, charity or not, we can't afford it. That led to an acrimonious discussion about my diminished position at work and my reduced salary. Jim already knew some of it, but they were sensitive issues I wanted to remain private because I was rather embarrassed about it. Carol smelled blood and was really vending now. She complained openly to Jim about her disappointment with me and frustrations with our lifestyle. I didn't want her to divulge any of that stuff, but it was too late. I admitted we had to cut back expenses to make sure Jenny's education was taken care of and we could make our mortgage payments. I hoped that would put some sense of reality into my wife, but she was unsympathetic. See what I mean, Carol, she sneered, gazing hopefully at Jim. He always comes up with some dumb excuse not to go out. 
I was pissed. These two were openly ganging up on me, countering my arguments and totally dismissing my concerns. Carol was gazing hopefully at Jim, waiting for him to say something to support her. Jim glanced at her and then looked at me with a sympathetic look. Well, Mark, why don't I cover you then? He quickly offered. I don't want to go by myself, and I have the cash. It'd be my pleasure to take you and Carol out to this event. You know we always have fun. I'd be disappointed if you weren't there. After all, you've been there for me this past year after my divorce, so in a way, I'll be paying you back. I'd love to take you both to keep me company. I'll drive and even pay for the babysitter too. Really? Carol squealed, already he was coming to her rescue. Oh gosh, Jim, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Before I could reject his offer, she ran around the table, hugged the guy, and kissed him, crying repeatedly, Thank you, Jim, thank you. I was steaming, not just about Jim contradicting my decision but also by Carol's gleeful reaction to his offer. She cared nothing about my opinion and practically threw herself at him right now. She was gushing openly like he was her savior. I shot Jim a look of disapproval as Carol continued to hug him. Carol squealed, and Jim bashfully accepted her praise while I sat across the table, feeling angry and disgusted. Despite what Carol said, I had no intention of accepting anyone's charity, even if it was from a friend. I was most put off by Carol's exuberant physical response. By now, Jim had his arm around her waist as she kissed his cheek and hugged him warmly. In no uncertain terms, I quickly rejected his offer. My pride wouldn't let me accept a handout from anybody. They stopped hugging, and Carol considered me coolly. Come on, Mark, Jim said, trying to defuse the tension. Noticing my dark expression, he told me with a smile, let's just go to that thing and have some fun. We can worry about the money later. No way. Damn you, I'm serious about this, Carol declared. Oh, just be quiet, Mark. You can pout about this all you want, but we're going, and that's final. We'll see about that. She looked at me like I was crazy. She got a weird look on her face, shook her head, and pulled away from Jim's embrace. Then she trotted to the kitchen, grabbed her cell phone, and called up one of her friends. With Carol in the other room, Jim and I sat there in silence. I glared at him across the table as we both heard my wife in the other room, chattering away. He looked a little uncomfortable as Carol chatted gleefully with her friend. Oh yes, we're going. I told you we would, she cried into the phone. Oh yeah, I know, well, not really, but I told you we were going. I know what you thought, girl, but I knew Jim would come through for us. He's been such a good friend. No, I don't think so, but you know how we can. Her voice suddenly dropped to a lower volume, so I couldn't hear her anymore. Then Carol peeked into the living room and glanced over at me with a smug look. She spoke quietly into the phone as she headed back into the other room for privacy. After that confrontation, the friendship Jim and I shared was broken. I thought as my buddy, he would have taken my side, but he didn't seem to be bothered about ignoring me. He tried a few times to explain that he just wanted Carol and me to have a good time, so I should just accept it. In my mind, he had taken sides, and it wasn't with me. A while later, my wife came back into the room with a huge smile on her face. She once again thanked Jim, hugging him and kissing his cheek. It seemed a bit over the top to me when she didn't seem to want to leave his embrace. I told them again that we're not going, and that was my decision. Jim tried to intervene, and Carol kept hugging him, informing me that she was going and wouldn't hear of it. I kept shaking my head no, but both Jim and my wife weren't listening. I guess they were determined to use the time before the event to get me to change my mind. Looking back, that argument may have been the beginning of the end of my once happy marriage. The week before the charity event was frosty in our house, even our daughter Jenny noticed a deep freeze. She was 14, but she wasn't stupid. She knew about the charity event and knew there was a simmering issue between Carol and me that wasn't being resolved. What's the matter, Dad? She asked one day when Carol was out of the room. I know that you and mom are arguing about something. She wants to accept charity, and I don't want to. Charity? You mean welfare or something? Not exactly, but it might as well be welfare, I told her. I wasn't brought up to depend on anyone. It's a matter of pride, 
Darling, once you start taking money from people, it's hard to stop. I've never accepted charity in my life and don't intend on starting now. It's about that charity event, isn't it? Yes, we simply can't afford it, Jenny. I'm not taking a handout just to put on a big show for our friends. But mom said it's from Uncle Jimmy, she replied, studying my reaction. He's your friend, isn't he? I'm sure he doesn't think it's charity, just one friend helping another. Is that how your mother sees it? Jenny lowered her eyes. Well, we spoke about it a little. That wasn't any surprise. Carol was pleading her case to get Jenny on her side behind my back. Knowing my clever wife was using my daughter to influence me pissed me off. I'm sure your mom has told you all about it. I said, holding my temper, but no matter if it's from a friend or not, it's still charity. I don't want to raise you thinking that we are that hard up. My dad never accepted charity his whole life, and he had more problems than we do. But dad, it's just a party. It's not like we're accepting cash, you know. And Uncle Jimmy is our friend. I was getting annoyed that she kept referring to Uncle Jimmy. I guess that's how Carol must refer to him when I'm not around. I answered my daughter with a little more anger than I should have. If your Uncle Jimmy, I sneered, accentuating his label, was my really friend, he'd keep his big mouth shut, his nose out of my affairs, and leave my family alone. My bitter reply caught Jenny off guard, and she drew back, looking scared. Then she ran up to her room and closed her door. I felt bad for speaking so bluntly, but I was sick of hearing about Uncle Jimmy and his gratuities. I needed my family to support my decision, although it seemed it wasn't the case. Each day, Carol kept smirking at me. I kept insisting that we weren't going to any charity event with or without Jim's help. Each time we had that discussion, she shot me a dark look and we had another argument. A few days before, Carol addressed me with undisguised aggravation. Listen, Mark, she said, I don't know why you got your panties in such a bunch about this. You know we go to this event every year, and I don't intend to miss it this year. Despite your problems at work, I know we're having a little financial difficulty right now. I get it. But we're certainly not poor, and we still need to keep up appearances. If we don't attend, all my friends will be aware of our problems. They'll be talking about us, about me, and I don't want to hear the gossip about it later. Jim has offered to help us out, and if you're the man I thought I married, you will accept it with a smile. So that's it, I blurted out angrily. I'm not man enough now. Oh, Mark, will you just stop? Of course you are. Just grow up. Then it's all about the gossip. Not all about it, but yes, I want our family to look good, and I do want to be considered a valued member of our social group. We have made a lot of friends over the years, and I want to go have an enjoyable evening with them. Don't you want to be seen with me? That's not fair, and you know it. Of course I want to be seen with you. I love you and always have. But this argument has gotten me quite pissed off. I thought you would support your husband, as a good wife should, and try to understand our situation. I can see that's not the case. So if you want to disrespect me this much, just go without me, you asshole, she cried angrily. You think I'm not a good wife? That's a bunch of bullshit, and you know it. For 16 years, I've taken care of you and Jenny without so much as a complaint. Like what? Damn it, she gazed at me with an icy glare. For a moment, she didn't speak. The silence was deafening as I waited her out. So you're going to the mat on this, are you? She said bitterly. I thought I could convince you that it would be good for us to have a night out together. Lord knows that hasn't happened lately. You haven't taken me out on a real date in months, and I'm sick of it. That's a lie. We go out to dinner as a family every week. We also go out dancing on occasion, just not to those posh, expensive joints you're hooked on. I told you, Carol, we can't afford that right now. Once Jenny's education is taken care of, I'm sure things will loosen up. Carol looked like she'd bit into a lemon as she listened to me. She seemed to come to a decision and suddenly calmed down, but the triumphant look on her face was troubling. So, my dear husband, if you aren't going to give me this one night out, then I guess I'll have to be Jim's date. I'm sure he'll be proud to have me, even if you aren't. And don't think it's going to be a platonic date either. 
I'm going to give your buddy all the attention that I would have given you, and I know he's going to appreciate it. You witch, I snapped with more anger than I'd felt in a while. I should have known you had this in your head. Don't let me stop you. Then go out with him. But don't think I'll forget this sordid betrayal. And I won't forget Uncle Jim's part in this either. I stormed out of the room and slammed the door as she yelled, You asshole. I'm going, damn it. Well, that didn't go well at all. As I stomped away, I passed by the living room. Jenny was watching TV. I knew she'd heard the whole argument when she glanced over at me with a frightened look. I wanted to hug and console her, to soothe her fears, but I was too worked up at my stubborn wife to say anything nice. So, I just went out onto the patio and sat in a chair, steaming. The day before the charity event found our house bitterly cold. Jim called me a few times during the week to convince me to change my mind. I wasn't having it, and the last time, I just hung up on him. Our finances were shaky enough, and we simply had to cut back. I had to face facts to keep our family secure, even if my wife wouldn't. If she wanted to make an issue about this, then she was going to get her wish. The night of the event, I'm sure Carol fixed dinner, but I made it a point to stay away and eat out at some cheap place. That night, I got home after Jenny and my wife had finished eating. I mumbled some greeting, and Jenny said, Hi, Dad. Carol didn't speak to me. She simply went into the bedroom and locked the door as she got ready for her date with Jim. To keep me from causing a scene, Carol decided to drive over to Jim's house and leave from there. When she came downstairs to leave, she made sure to strut around the living room, displaying her sexy attire. If I wasn't pissed off before, I was livid now. She had on a short, tight aqua dress I'd never seen before. It was shockingly brief and displayed her curves like it was painted onto her slender body. Her long hair was flowing, her makeup was fixed, and the high heels she had on made her shapely legs look great. Where'd you get that dress? Don't worry about it. Where did she get the money to buy such an obviously expensive dress? But she wasn't going to tell me, so I kept quiet. Carol ignored me as she went to where Jenny was sitting in front of the TV, leaned down, and gave our daughter a kiss. Wow, you look wonderful, Mom. You look like a movie star in that dress. Thanks, dear. Carol's smile disappeared as she glanced pointedly over at me. She told Jenny loud enough for me to hear, I know Uncle Jim will think so too. I just wish everybody felt the same way. Of course, that comment was directed at me, and I was furious. Unlike when we went out, Carol never looked this good on any of our dates. But for Uncle Jim, she went all out. I could see this was going to be an issue. I just looked at her with disgust and walked out of the room. I wanted her to know I was angry, and she definitely knew it. Goodbye, Jenny, Carol said, walking to the door, speaking to my daughter and ignoring me. I may be out late, honey, so don't wait up. She walked out the door and didn't look back. Jenny saw my dismal look and shot me a look of pure pity, which again pissed me off. I knew she hated being in the middle of this, and I wasn't happy either. Something about my daughter pitying me made me even more angry. I marched to the den and shot off a quick text to my former best friend. I thought we were friends, Jim. Now that you're dating my wife, I know you're just another asshole. After tonight, don't bother contacting me, and don't consider yourself my friend. You're not welcome here ever again. Have a good time with my witch of a wife, you prick. I quickly got one back. It's not a date. Mark, and you know it. I wanted you to come, but you're too stubborn. I'm just letting Carol have some fun, and then I'll make sure she gets home safe. We'll have to talk later. Please don't be upset with me. I sent back, screw you. I didn't hear back. I tried to keep my mind off my wife, but it was impossible. Jenny and I watched TV for a while and tried to converse like nothing was wrong. I don't even know what we watched. She could tell I was upset. To her credit, Jenny spoke kindly to me and tried to make me feel better. I was pleased about that, but it wasn't going to be a good night, and we both knew it. Around 10, Jenny went to bed. It was early for her, the situation was so awkward I guess she couldn't take the tension. I could hear her talking on her cell phone with somebody when I went to bed. Somehow, I managed to sleep, but I was woken up by the noise of the front door closing. 
I glanced at the clock and saw it was 2.30 in the morning. I could hear voices downstairs and knew it was my wife and my former friend. I rolled out of bed and glanced into the living room. They were still near the front door and it was clear Carol was sloppy drunk. So drunk and unstable, she was hanging onto Jim's arm for support. Her hair was messed up, her eyes were droopy, and she was swaying and giggling. Thank you for such a wonderful time tonight, Jimmy, she laughed, slurring her words and hugging him close. She threw her arms around his neck, pressed her lean body against his, and gave him a steamy kiss on the lips. It lasted far longer than was proper, and Carol didn't seem like she wanted it to end. Finally, Jim pulled back and glanced around tentatively. It was fun, but it's late, and you should get to bed now, Carol. But I don't want to go to bed. Mark might be worried about you. Screw him, she sneered with a giggle. He's a wet blanket, and I had so much fun with you tonight. Let's do it again, okay? I was at the top of the stairs where they couldn't see me. Jim looked uneasy as he glanced toward the hallway. He knew our bedroom was located there. He couldn't see me, but he was probably wondering if I was listening to them. Let's not talk about that now, he told her. Go get a shower, get some sleep, and try to make up with your husband. Screw that asshole, she slurred, and again fell into his arms. Why don't you stay and have a drink with me? It's not that late, honey. No, I don't think that's such a great idea. You know he's upset, right? I showed you his text earlier. He's having a snit and I don't care. Why don't we go over to the sofa and I'll get you a drink? Please, no, Carol. Not tonight. Oh, come on, she murmured and pulled his head down for a kiss. This time, Carol French kissed him for a bit before he pushed her away. Please, Carol, I'm trying to keep us out of trouble, he chuckled. You're making that real hard right now. I was already pissed but I was dumbfounded when I saw her hand move between them and clutch his crotch through his trousers. I can tell you're hard and big too, she giggled merrily. In fact, I've known you were quite big every time we danced together. Come on, don't go yet. Jim was smirking but pulled her hand off his crotch and said, you better stop. Come on, Jim. I can tell you want to. Let's go to the sofa and let me show you how much I appreciate all the attention you showed me tonight. No, I'm serious, Carol, Jim said, looking more worried. I know you're a beautiful woman and I'm horny, sure, but I don't want to cause any more trouble with Mark. We are friends, you know, and you're my friend too. Mark's asleep and he doesn't give a damn about me. I want you to be my special friend, Jim. Please, come and stay for a little while. I couldn't take any more of it. I stepped into the room with a look of hate on my face. Yeah. Jim, I said curtly, startling them both. Why don't you be Carol's special friend, you asshole? Jim and Carol both jumped at my presence. In a sarcastic tone, I continued, Why don't you stay for a little while and screw my cheap, drunk wife after such a nice date? I'm sure she'll love that. Jim's eyes widened, and his face fell. He pushed my wife away, and Carol gazed at me with bloodshot eyes, trying to focus. It took a moment for her to regain her composure and sober up a little. Listen, Mark, Jim started to say. No, you listen, you face. I can see now just how much of a special friend you were to my wife. So just screw her. Take her over to the sofa and give the filthy whore what she wants. Jim shook his head sadly and turned to leave. Carol cried out in protest, grabbed his arm, and pulled him back. Just shut up, Mark. Jim was nice to me all night, and he doesn't deserve this. Then give him what he deserves, which... I cried. You want his big, hard meat, so go for it, you cheating whore. Damn you, asshole. Carol screamed, her face was as red as a beet. Jim just wanted to crawl into a hole. Listen, Mark, Jim said apologetically. I know you're upset about tonight and all, but we did have a great time, and nothing happened. I have your word on that, right shithead? Yeah, nothing happened. I know this looks bad. Why, Uncle Jim, I have to ask angrily. Why does it look bad? Because my whore of a wife is trying to give you a hand job and maybe more for being so nice, or because she's taking you over to the sofa to enjoy sex. 
Is that it, Uncle Jim? Jim looked at Carol, then at me. He shook his head and headed for the front door to make his escape. On the way, he said to me, No, Mark, listen. I've gotta go. He told my drunk wife, I better go now, Carol. I'll help you get your car later if you want. I think he was going to say more but saw my glare and instead twisted away from Carol's grasp and hustled out the front door as it closed behind him. Carol seemed to deflate. She looked drunk and dejected as she stumbled into the kitchen to get some water, probably to sober up. I left her there by herself and trudged back to bed. My marriage was no longer on solid ground. Carol woke up on the sofa, she never made it upstairs. I found her lying there the next morning, sprawled out in her new dress. I tried to hold in my anger as I helped her up to the bedroom and flopped her onto the bed. I didn't undress her and left her lying in that tight, obviously expensive aqua dress. I did take off her high heels and pull the cover over her. Carol slept until late afternoon, painfully hung over, and I could understand why after watching her drunken performance last night. I was angry as hell that she just threw herself at Jim but decided not to act like it. I wanted to see how she would play it before tipping my hand. I knew our relationship had been off for quite a while, the argument about the charity event was just the latest disagreement. However, it was the biggest argument we had ever had. Carol finally made it up for dinner and looked like she didn't want to speak. I just kept silent, determined to make her bring up her disgusting behavior. She slept in the guest room, and the rest of the weekend, we tiptoed around each other. She was so drunk, I'm not sure Carol even remembered much about that night. She's not a drinker, so whatever she consumed that night probably had her nearly blacking out. Saturday morning, I made Jenny and me breakfast. She mentioned Carol coming home with Jim and asked what the argument was about. I didn't offer much of an explanation, just that we're still working through the charity event issue. Jenny accepted that vague explanation and left the house early. She told me she was going to go over to a friend's. I told her to call in a few hours to check in. I went to work on Monday as usual. Carol took a while to recover and didn't go to work until Wednesday. We didn't speak about that night until the middle of the next week. I think it took her that long to clear her head from all the alcohol she drank. She acted embarrassed when she tried to apologize for her behavior. I was still too angry to accept any apology. I let her tell me that she was sorry, then spun around and left her standing there. That pissed her off, but I didn't care anymore. Jim called me a couple of times. I ignored his calls and let them go to voicemail. I listened as he apologized about how that night turned out and that he wanted to talk about it. He wanted to meet me, but I never responded. I'm sure he wanted to soften the guilt he felt for betraying me. I didn't give a damn about him anymore, as far as I was concerned, our friendship was over. One evening when I was out washing the car, I went inside for something and heard Carol speaking on the phone in the kitchen. She didn't know I was there, so I tried to listen to her conversation, yes, it was wonderful, she told whoever she was speaking to. I know he's still pissed at me. Ah, you think so? Thanks. No, Mark didn't get it, it was Jim that bought it for me. Yeah. I know, it cost a fortune. He's such a sweetheart and so handsome. I would have, ha, but Mark woke up as I was trying to get him to. Yeah, I know Mark saw me trying to get him, and yes, I know, ha ha ha, oh, it sure was not only big but hard too, real hard. My 304 wife was talking to one of her girlfriends about Jim's meat. Oh, Mark would have a fit if he knew that. No, you can't tell him, no ah, I have to keep that quiet. I hope he does. We're trying to figure out when. I know, but I have to be careful. Mark doesn't know why he called me. He's been calling me all week. I don't know if I can. Of course, I want to. Who wouldn't want to date a guy like Jim? You better not. I'm serious. Okay, I know she chattered a little more, but I'd heard enough. I was almost sure she was going to date my ex-friend. I could hardly believe how much our marriage had crumbled in the last few weeks. I caught Carol on the phone a couple more times. Whenever I entered the room, she'd either turn away and speak softly or simply hang up. On the weekend, Jim suddenly showed up at our house in his big SUV. I was in the driveway fiddling with my car when he pulled in front. He got out of his big car and strode up our walk, smiling as if everything was fine. 
Carol must have known he was coming because the second he got out, she immediately came outside with a weird smile on her face. We hadn't been speaking, so when she approached me and began to speak to me, I was immediately on my guard. Hi honey, I invited Jim over for dinner, she told me flat out. When I started to object, she held up her hand to stop me. Listen Mark, I know what you're going to say. You're still upset about that night, but I think that you two need to talk. Jim wants to. We need to get over this and get back to being friends again. Jim was a few feet away and smiled as he approached. Hi Mark, he said good-naturedly and held out his hand. Nice to see you again, buddy. I just stared at that idiot with a cold look, trying to defuse the situation. Carol moved next to me with a sweet smile and slipped her arm around my waist. She whispered, go on, honey, with a big smile as she tried to coax me forward to shake his hand. I just let it hang there in the air and ignored it. Jim's smile disappeared as he realized the insult and lowered his hand. Next to me, my wife tried to soften the tense atmosphere. Hi Jim, she gushed, ignoring my harsh glare. Nice to see you. I'm glad you came over today. I was just telling Mark it was time to clear the air. Screw you, I snapped. Carol was startled, her bright smile wilted a bit. Please, Mark, Jim said, I know you're still upset, but, oh, you got that, did you? I felt my wife's arm tighten around my waist. She snuggled against me, trying to keep me from getting any angrier. Please, honey, Carol purred, pressing my arm against her breast. She tried to kiss my cheek. Don't be mad at him. It's my fault what happened, not his. Jim's been your friend for so long, and I know you miss him. He misses you too, right Jim? That's right, Jim quipped. Come on, Mark, no hard feelings, right, buddy? I shot him a look that could kill, then I twisted out of Carol's grasp. I looked straight into his eyes, wishing I could shoot this creep. In an ominous tone, I asked him, so tell me, buddy, did you have a good time with my wife at the charity event? Well, yeah, of course we did, Carol chirped. We wanted you to come, Mark. It would have been more fun if you were there, honey. You would have loved it. She hadn't spoken to me in nearly a week, and now she was acting all sweet and innocent. I didn't believe her for a second. Jim gazed back at me tentatively, and I looked right into his eyes. So, did you guys dance together? I asked him. Well, yeah, everyone was dancing and all, Jim replied. Of course, Carol moved next to me again and slipped her arm around me with a sugary sweet smile frozen on her face. Of course we danced, Mark. Everyone was dancing and having a great time, like I said. You would have loved it if you had come. I ignored my wife's irritating chatter and kept my attention on Jim. So, you danced, huh? Did you dance the slow songs, Jim, old buddy? Hold Carol in your arms, feel her tits against your chest in that skimpy dress she had on? His face twisted into a strange grimace. He was uncomfortable, perplexed by these probing questions. No, nothing like that. Mark, he replied innocently. Just then, Carol moved next to me again and slipped her arm around me with a sugary sweet smile frozen on her face. Of course we danced, Mark. Everyone was dancing and having a great time, like I said. You. I pushed Carol away so she stood next to Jim and turned my attention to her. And you, my dear honest wife, I sneered. Was it all just some casual, friendly dancing like Jim said? Just two friends engaged in some platonic activity? Nothing inappropriate, right? Of course not, Mark, she blustered. I'd never do anything to disrespect you, honey, you know that. I pulled out my cell phone and opened up a picture. A guy I knew was at the event with his wife. At my request, he sent me a few incriminating photos of my wife and Jim. I turned the phone so Carol could see it. It took my wife a moment to realize it was her and Jim dancing close at the charity event. Suddenly, the blood drained from her face and her eyes bulged out. So, my faithful wife dancing like this with my dear old friend is just some platonic dancing, right, honey? I snickered sarcastically as she gazed at the phone. Jim moved closer to see and his face went dark. Where did you get this? He asked. 
It was a side shot of Carol and Jim on the dance floor. Couples were dancing all around them, some glancing with amusement at my wife and my former friend engaged in an intimate embrace. Jim's taller than me, and he towered over Carol. That didn't stop her from sliding her arms around his neck, pressing her lithe body against his, and Jim leaning down to kiss her on the lips. It was a still shot, so there was no way to know how long the kiss lasted, but to someone who didn't know them, it was very incriminating. Carol's face blanched as she saw how intimate their embrace was, not to mention the kiss. I heard Jim gulp. Oh boy, I flipped to another picture and asked Carol, my dear, I guess you enjoyed that kiss by how you were gazing up into his eyes. The next shot was closer, with only their upper bodies in view. Jim's hands were placed around her waist, and Carol was gazing up at him with adoration in her eyes. A couple next to them was watching with smiles on their faces. I flipped to another picture, and this one had them sitting in a booth, Jim's arm around her shoulders, his hand hovering over her breast. Carol was leaning against his shoulder, her face turned up to his, as if expecting another kiss. The last was a shot of them outside on a patio, hugging with Carol making no effort to pull away. Jim's hand on her bum this time as she leaned against his tall frame. They weren't kissing, but seemed about to. Both Jim and my wife were stunned at the photos. Jim's face flushed with embarrassment, and he began making choking sounds, as if trying to speak. Who sent them to you? Carol asked. What difference does that make? Well, I know that looks bad, honey, she mumbled. B, but it's really not like that at all. Oh, really, Carol? I said in disbelief. It sure looks like my wife and my former friend were having an intimate date, making out, fondling each other, and who knows what else. Probably screwing in the parking lot, something you invited him to do on our sofa, remember that, you stupid witch. I gazed straight into Carol's eyes as she lowered hers. I can't believe you acted like a whore right in front of people we know. Did you get a nice feel of his big hard tool, honey? Were you going to screw him when you got home, or, or was that the second time you would have gotten lucky that night? Mark, no way, Jim blurted out. I know that looks bad and all, but it really wasn't like that at all. No one thought we were a couple, we just had a few too many drinks and were having fun. Carol cut in, yes, Mark, it was more my fault than Jim's, she explained, trying to sound reasonable. I probably had too much to drink, and I got a little frisky, but nothing happened, honey. Only a little kiss and a bit of hugging, you know, probably a little inappropriate, but nothing to worry about. Did you get a good feel of his big meat, Carol? Her jaw dropped. I heard Jim gulp, and he seemed to slump a bit. No answer, I said accusingly. I turned to Jim, whose eyes were darting around with guilt all over his face. Did you buy her that dress, asshole? Don't try to lie, you creep. Well, uh, he started to say glancing over at Carol. My wife stopped him with a wave and said softly, yes, he did, Mark. Her eyes lowered. I needed something nice to wear and I haven't bought anything new in ages. The dress was a gift from Jim, and I knew you wouldn't like it, so I decided not to tell you. And those hooker heels you had on, the ones that made you stand about five inches taller and made you look like a cheap $20 escort? Come on, Mark, Jim said with irritation. They're not like that. Carol's flushed face and darting eyes told me all I needed to know. I see exactly how it is, you witch, I snapped at her. He basically bought you that night, and you tried to reward him later. You know that's what paid escorts do, don't you? Carol's shame seemed to wilt her. Her face grew hard, and her eyes were blazing. Jim tried to say, please, Mark, there's no call for that now. I spun around to him and shouted, you made my wife a whore, and you have the nerve to tell me there's nothing wrong? You're a real creep. I wish you were dead, both of you. One of our neighbors was watching from the porch. Carol noticed that we had an audience. She blushed and looked embarrassed. I have nothing more to say to those two, I muttered as I jumped in my car to leave. Jim moved quickly and tried to grab my arm. When he pulled me back, I twisted around and took a swing at him. I missed and he shoved me to the ground before I could swing again. He could have flattened me with one punch, the guy is taller and bigger than me by at least 40 pounds. Not only bigger, but more muscular and athletic. A physical confrontation would only make me look foolish. 
I got up and brushed myself off as he held his hands in a defensive manner, trying to calm me down. As for turning my wife into a whore, I said, glancing at Carol with disgust, well, asshole, you're definitely doing a great job. She was staring at me with a shocked expression. The neighbors on the porch were clearly interested now, another couple from down the street was walking by and watching the argument closely. You're his whore now, aren't you? I yelled loud enough for our audience to hear. He paid for your dress, your hooker heels, and your date, so just take him inside and give him the payoff, some of your leaking holes or a blowjob. We all know that's what you wanted to do that night, right? I moved toward my car, and this time he didn't interfere. Another neighbor peeked out their door, wondering about all the commotion. Carol was blushing pink as she noticed that we had an even larger audience now. One thing I learned about her recently was how important her reputation was to her. This public airing of our differences was probably killing her. Mark, please stop, she pleaded in a whisper. Don't go away yet. It's not like that. Let's go inside and talk this out. Yeah, Mark, we really need to clear the air, man, the asshole agreed. I looked at them both like they were a piece of shit on my shoe. Yeah, I want to finish this, I told them bitterly. So, if you're still here when I get back, I'm going to get my gun and blow you away. You clear about that, Jim? Jim gazed at me in silence. Carol looked sullen and angry. I spit at their feet, jumped in my car, pulled out of the driveway, and sped off burning rubber in the process. Our neighborhood would have juicy gossip for months. When I got home that night, Jim was gone. Carol was in bed, and I was smashed to the gills. I had a cab bring me home because I was too drunk to drive, and the bartender wouldn't let me out of the bar with my car keys. I fell onto the sofa and didn't wake up until about noon the next day. I quickly called in sick to work, my boss was pissed, but there was no way I was able to perform being so hungover. I also took the next day off too because I still wasn't right. I finally woke up and got some food in my stomach, that seemed to help. Carol was gone to her part-time job at the art gallery, and Jenny was at school. I guess I was feeling a little guilty about my behavior, I don't know why, though. I still blamed Carol and Jim for the problem. When Jenny returned home from school, I apologized for my loud confrontation. She acted like it was no big deal, but I knew she had probably witnessed the whole thing and heard everything I said to her mother and Uncle Jimmy. We spoke about it for a while and then left it alone. I fixed dinner before Carol got home, she wasn't home on time, and Jenny and I ate dinner without her. I was still pissed, but my hangover softened my anger a bit. When my wife finally did make her appearance, I didn't confront her again and just left her alone. We ate, cleaned up the dishes and went to sleep that night without touching each other or even speaking. The next day, we tried to act normal for Jenny's sake, and the atmosphere around the house was a bit better. She did make a sort of apology, saying she was sorry I didn't attend the event, and no matter how bad those pictures looked, nothing inappropriate went on between Jim and her. I noted that she didn't say she was sorry she went, just that she was sorry how it worked out. I let her speak and didn't offer an answer. A few days later, I overheard her on the phone again. She thought I was in the backyard and didn't notice I was around the corner when she was speaking openly. It's okay. Yeah, I can talk. He's out in the yard. No, he's still real upset about everything. I don't want to approach him about that yet. Yeah, well, you know I do. Maybe if we are careful, we can. I don't know. I just don't want to stir up any more trouble. She listened for a bit then said, he won't be so forgiving next time. Okay, yeah, I'll call you later. Of course, I miss you. We can't. No, please, I know. Just let me talk to him first. Okay, right, I'll work on him tonight and get back to you, probably tomorrow. Yeah, I can't talk right now. He was out in the yard, but I'm not sure where he is now. Okay, that's okay. Right, call me. Okay, bye. Then she hung up. I knew something was up, but I wasn't sure what. I supposed she was speaking to Jim, but I couldn't be sure. Coincidentally, Jim called me that very evening. It was just after dinner when I was outside on the patio. It was Friday, and Jenny was sleeping over at a friend's house. She would return Saturday afternoon. 
I saw the caller ID on my phone and debated whether to take the call. Carol suddenly trotted outside. Is that your phone, honey? She asked me as it was ringing. Now I knew it was a setup. Why don't you answer it, Mark? I grumbled and picked it up. What do you want, a-hole? I grumbled, knowing it was Jim. Hi, buddy. I just wanted to talk, he said cheerfully. Carol was watching me as I replied, oh yeah. Well, I want a faithful, loving, honest wife, so what? Listen, Mark, I know things have been a little tense between us, so I wanted to do something to break the ice. I didn't reply. I'm having a little get-together at my house. I want to invite you and Carol to join us. It's just a few of our friends that are invited, all nice folks from the area that you know. I'm going to cook out, so you don't have to bring anything. Just show up and have a good time. I was silent as I considered his offer. The truth is, I was feeling a little regretful the past few days. Despite my anger, I still loved Carol. I knew she missed having a social life like we used to, and I wished I could entertain her better. Jim used to be a good friend, my best friend actually. Despite my feelings, I missed having some guy to hang out with. I noticed that Carol was nearby, staring out at the yard, but clearly pretending she wasn't listening. These two were so transparent it was almost funny. I don't know, please, Mark. I know how you feel, but we can't go on like this forever. Let's bury the hatchet for a while and have a few beers with friends. Bring Carol, and I'm sure we can all put this beside us, okay? I glanced at Carol. She looked over and smiled. We'll see. I'll speak to Carol, and we'll see, I said. I hope you come, both of you. It's just casual, I have all the food and beer taken care of, so don't worry about bringing anything. I know you'll have a blast, buddy. Hope to see you later. I sat down the phone, and Carol immediately asked, Who was that, honey? Nobody, I said indifferently. Carol looked perplexed. Nobody? Tell me, she asked sweetly, as if she didn't know. Having a party, I said indifferently. Oh really, she exclaimed, smiling. That's nice. Yeah, he wants us to go, he wants to bury the hatchet, I said. Carol seemed eager to speak, but she just smiled and asked, so what did you tell him? Are we going? I guess so, I said. She jumped over to me and hugged me close. After so long apart, I felt myself becoming aroused by the warmth of her body. Oh, goody, that's great, Mark, she gushed. I know we'll have a great time. Don't count on it, I snorted. She kissed my cheek, then bolted for the house to get ready. I was leery about this whole setup, but I was worn down from all the acrimony and was willing to see how this turned out. Either way, Carol couldn't blame me for not trying to improve our situation. As for Jim and I becoming friends again, that was doubtful. The party was actually quite nice. There were about 30 people there, which was more than I expected. Jim went all out with the food and drinks. Most of the people were married couples, with a few unattached females and a couple of single guys. There were enough people there that it wasn't obvious that I was keeping my distance from Jim. Carol stayed by me much of the time. She did go off with her friends for a while, and I hung out with the guys. I drank some beer, but not too much. I wasn't going to get drunk and suddenly act like everything was back to normal. I think Carol noticed my distant demeanor, I thought. Is everything okay? She whispered. I didn't look at her as I mumbled. Yeah, nice party, isn't it though? I'm having fun. I hope you're too, she said, gazing into my eyes, hopefully. Then she asked quietly, have you spoken to Jim? My expression darkened, and she noticed. Sorry, I don't want to upset you, Mark. Then just leave it alone. You two are such good friends, and I hope you will be again. Forget it, Carol, I told her with a cold glance. Jim and I will never be friends again, not like before. He's an a-hole and always will be. Let's just have fun tonight and not bring up any old bad memories. Carol didn't drink much, and neither did I. Jim was busy playing host and only came over a couple of times to ask how everything was. He had a woman with him, some hot chick he knew from work, and they were sharing host duties. Carol drifted over to Jim and his date, they spoke for a while. When Carol returned, 
she brought Jim's date over and introduced me. I just nodded and let my wife do all the talking. I don't even remember her name. She probably thought I'm an idiot for not acting more polite, but screw her and screw Jim too. After a few more minutes of awkward conversation, they went over to the bar and mixed some drinks. Later, Jim put on some music and people began to dance. Carol asked me if I wanted to dance. I said no. She was a bit put off but didn't complain about it. The sun began to set and the couples with children began to leave. The rest of the crowd began to drink more. A few other couples showed up and joined in. Soon, the beer was flowing freely and the party was starting to get rowdy. Several of the wives we knew were no longer dancing with their spouses. A couple of guys asked Carol to dance. She wearily accepted after getting my tacit permission. I stayed in my seat and just watched her in silence. Carol is an attractive woman, so it was no shock when guys kept asking her to dance. She danced some of the fast songs, displaying her moves, which were very sexy. When the slow songs came on, she was regularly glancing at me. Normally, she could be quite flirty at events like this. Tonight, she kept her flirtatious behavior to a minimum. She did seem to enjoy herself but didn't dance too closely with any of her partners, nothing like the pictures I saw of her and Jim at the charity event. And she didn't dance with Jim. When she noticed I wasn't joining in the wife-swapping atmosphere, she quit dancing and sat by me. Carol had briefly left my side and was talking with her friends when Jim's date came over and asked me to dance. I politely refused. She flashed a pout and asked if I wanted another beer. I told her no thanks. She was a pretty young thing, cute with a nice body, typical of the girls Jim always had around him, but I had no interest in her and tried to give non-verbal hints that I didn't want her company. Instead of getting the hint, she plopped down next to me, gulped her beer, flashed a huge grin, and started a conversation. She wouldn't leave, so to be polite, I chatted with her. She seemed a little drunk and kept giggling at things I said that weren't funny. Between giggles, she kept touching me, rubbing my arm and my leg while laughing. She kept offering to get me another beer, I kept refusing. She kept trying to get me up to dance. At one point, she stood up and began pulling on my arm, making a big scene in front of the people around us. Everyone was laughing at my reluctance. I was embarrassed and asked her to stop. She stopped and began talking for a while before she did it again, but this time, she slipped and accidentally fell onto my lap. I tried to get her to her feet, but she resisted. She just stayed there, laughing, rubbing her tight little bum on my groin, with her arms around my neck. I removed her arms from my neck and lifted her up. As I was moving her, I happened to glance across the deck. There was Jim and Carol next to each other, speaking softly together, but really watching me fend off this drunk girl. Suddenly, I knew what was up. This whole party was a setup. They were trying to manipulate me into behaving as they had at the charity event. This sexy girl was basically throwing herself at me, trying to get me to behave badly so I wouldn't be able to criticize them. I shot my wife a harsh stare. She caught my look, cringed, and realized I was onto their trick. I kept my eyes on my conniving wife as I kept pushing the girl away. When she wouldn't stop pestering me, I unceremoniously shoved her off my lap. The people around us were laughing as I marched across the deck away from this cheap bimbo. I passed by Jim and growled, nice try, a-hole. His expression darkened as I marched away. A few moments later, Carol came trotting over, probably to deny there was any ulterior motive. I didn't want to hear any more lies. When she started to say something, I cut her off with a glare. The party was in full swing as I informed my wife it was time to leave. She looked disappointed but didn't argue. I didn't bother to thank Jim for the invitation and went straight to my car. Carol said it was impolite not to thank him, so she made her way to Jim and his date. She spoke to them for a bit as Jim glanced over at me with a strange look. I was glad that he didn't come over to me because I'm not sure how I would have handled it. Carol then said goodbye to her friends. She obviously wanted to hang around because the party was still going strong. But she respected my wishes and we left the party as quickly as I could. The drive home was somber. Carol casually mentioned how much fun she had and how nice everything was. I just nodded and kept silent. Carol chattered on about some of her friends and how nicely Jim had set everything up, but my silence conveyed the strained atmosphere. 
By the time we got home, I realized the whole thing was a setup, Jim's invitation, Jenny's sleepover scheduled the same night, and his girlfriend trying to make a fool out of me. I was being manipulated, but I held my tongue, and Carol was relieved that I didn't make a scene. Since the evening was all planned out, I wasn't surprised when my clever wife began making amorous advances from the moment we got home. She was acting sweet, touching, and kissing me all the way to the bedroom. It had been quite a while since we had sex, probably more than a month. Despite my irritation with my conniving wife, Carol's a sexy woman. Tonight, she was dressed to tease and please, and by this time, I was horny as a goat. I refused and turned the other way. I just lay there in the dark, thinking about the party we went to. I replayed the evening when she was dancing and having fun. I remembered her speaking to Jim and how he kept glancing over at me while they talked. It was all contrived, they were manipulating me. I replayed every second of their conversation and kept thinking about Carol's giddy reaction as they talked. I also remembered the night when she decided to go with Jim and how comfortable she was hugging and kissing him, and how anxious she was to get him onto the sofa. I know she was drunk and horny, but something about their friendly relationship didn't seem right. Jim's reaction also bothered me, he seemed to enjoy making out with my wife, but worried about the location. I'm not sure that he wouldn't have taken her up on her offer if Jenny and I weren't there. I know he's been a friend for decades, but the way he made out with my wife and how friendly they were seemed wrong. Have they done this before? Maybe this wasn't the first time they dated. I tried to put these paranoid feelings aside because I wanted to trust Carol, and I used to trust Jim too. Inside my head, a little voice was whispering caution. Over dinner, Carol was quite animated about the party we went to. There was no mention of the charity event. Jim called me a few times after his party, but I didn't answer and just let it go to voicemail. His message was that he was glad we came to his house and that he'd like to get together again real soon. He wanted us to get back to being friends, and he'd go more than halfway to get there. I told Carol that Jim had been calling me, but I wished he wouldn't. She seemed pleased to hear that we had contact. She asked if she could invite him over for dinner. When I told her no, Carol frowned, and we had another argument. She eventually told me to just get over my hissy fit, as she so delicately put it, and kept reminding me what a good friend Jim was and how he'd been there to help us. I knew he was successful at his sales job and made more than me. I was sick of hearing her praise him so often but kept my mouth shut. I guess Carol thought that everything was back to normal between us. Probably Jenny did too, she was now talking about Jim as if he was still my friend. I wasn't actually there yet, but in the interest of keeping the family atmosphere pleasant, I held my tongue. That turned out to be a big mistake. I tried to keep tabs on Carol, but since she worked part-time and I was very busy at my job, it wasn't possible. She was home each night when I got home, and she always had dinner ready for Jenny and me. We tried to have sex, but she seemed distracted at times like she was just going through the motions. Of course, I got off, but if I expected all the little kisses and touches our lovemaking had been before, that didn't happen anymore. I was disappointed in our degraded relationship, but with my job taking so much of my energy, I didn't have the patience to address it. Carol didn't seem like it bothered her at all. She kept up the house, kept Jenny taken care of, but we were barely making love now. I guess I should have been happy for that. I managed to get off early one night and wanted to take Carol out to dinner, An early evening lately meant getting home before 6 o'clock. It would be a late dinner for us, but I thought I could get Jenny to stay over at her friend's house that night, and we could go out later. Of course, our finances were stretched, but I thought we needed some time to reconnect. I called home, but Carol wasn't there. So, I called her at work that afternoon, and a woman answered and told me that Carol wasn't available. Oh, all right. Will she be available later? I asked. Not today. She took the afternoon off, she replied. She should be back on Monday though. Can I take a message? No, I'll try her then, I said, perplexed. She wasn't at work, she hadn't called me and never mentioned that she had plans to take the day off. I called her cell phone and it rolled over to voicemail, so I left a message. Hi Carol, just wanted to ask you out for dinner tonight. I miss taking you out and would love to take you to a nice place and show you off. Please call me back and I'll make all the arrangements. Normally, I'd get home by 7 or later. 
I guess she expected me then, but I was pissed when she didn't call me back until nearly 6 o'clock. Hi Mark, she said cheerfully. Sorry I missed your call, honey. I wanted to take you out, I sighed. I guess now it's too late. Oh, I'm so sorry, baby, she replied. I had to meet with a client, you know. It ran a little late, so I couldn't get back to you. Okay then, see you at home, right? Love you. Love you too. The conversation was weird. Meet with a client? When did Carol start meeting with clients? Her co-worker never mentioned that. Why take the day off, and why was her phone off? I hardly ever called during the day, so she had no reason to expect me to. But the whole thing stunk, and I wasn't sure why. I picked up some pizza and just went home. When I got there, both Carol and Jenny were waiting. Jenny was happy about the pizza, and Carol apologized about missing my call. I didn't question her about it, but it was strange and had me thinking bad thoughts. That night, Carol informed me that there was a big party at the Royal Hotel this weekend, and she wanted to go. It's going to be wonderful, Mark, she gushed before she saw my dark look and quipped, now don't look at me like that. I know what you're thinking. Don't worry, honey. It's not going to cost you anything. There's no cover charge for this, and my company is picking up the tab for the dinner and drinks. It's some kind of a public relations gig to attract customers. There's also going to be a band, dancing, and everything. We're going to have a blast this weekend. Are you sure we're free this weekend? Carol shot me a goofy grin and snickered. Oh, stop it, you wet blanket. You know we are. We don't go anywhere anymore. And don't worry, you won't have to pay a dime. I listened to her excitement about this party. I wished there was some way out of it, but she had her mind made up. I just hoped everything would go all right. Despite my reluctance, I was actually looking forward to taking her to this party. My wife is very attractive and fun. I wanted to take her to a nice private dinner and maybe some dancing, but we needed a night out together, and maybe this public party was it. Little did I know, the night before the party, she hit me with the rest of the story. She was mentioning details of the party when she said in a suspicious manner, and you know Jim's going to be there too, honey. Jim? What the hell? I didn't know that. We were finishing dinner, and Jenny was already in her room. Carol was just staring at her plate, moving the food around with her fork. Honey, Jim said he would be there, I blurted out with surprise. She looked startled for a second but regained her composure quickly. I heard from someone at work, she said without looking up. Why is Jim going to be there? I think he's dating one of the clients. You mean that woman he had at his party? No, not her, somebody else. I think Jim's going to be there, I repeated angrily. Tell me the truth, Carol. Have you spoken to him about this dance party? She glanced up at me with a guilty look and mumbled, No, not really. I just heard something. Maybe I forgot. He called you, didn't he? I accused, feeling a knot in my stomach. I guess maybe, she said, her casual attitude suddenly transforming to irritation. Yes, he called me. He did. So what? You know I don't like that prick. And now I find out you're speaking to him behind my back. It's not like that, she answered defensively. He's a friend. He just called up to say he'd be there and hoped we would too. I stood up with an angry expression. I shoved the rest of my food into the trash and rinsed off my plate. That's just great, I sneered. After all we've been through, you're talking to that asshole behind my back? He's our friend, Mark. My friend too, she said defensively. He's no friend of mine, and you're calling him and probably sneaking around with him behind my back. Her eyes looked straight at me as she stated firmly, you can't tell me who to talk to. I'm a grown woman, and I can choose my own friends. I just wanted you to know ahead of time that he'll be there. I was just being polite and didn't want to spring it on you and make you think that it was some setup. Can't you see that? Yeah, yeah, I see exactly. I already told you that I want you to stop talking to him. I guess you don't give a damn about my feelings. That's not true. Just don't have any contact with him. You hear? No, damn it, Mark. 
I'll talk to him if I want, she replied curtly. He's a friend, and I will not shut him out. If you want to ignore Jim, I can't stop you, but I'm not going to turn my back on a friend of ours. So that's it. Yes, she said sympathetically as she placed her hand on mine. I don't want you to be mad. I want my husband back. Please go to this party with me. All my friends will be there. It's important to me, honey. I left it like that. I was going, but I wasn't happy about it. The night of the party, I drove Jenny over to her friend's house. She was going to stay the night so Carol and I could party as late as we liked. Carol spent most of the evening getting ready. She had her hair done and her makeup too. I just had to put on a suit and shoes, which took me about 10 minutes. Carol must have spent over an hour in the bedroom. When she came down, she looked stunning in a skimpy black cocktail dress that displayed her sumptuous curves to the max. Where'd you get that dress? I've never seen it before, I immediately thought aloud. Carol shot me a gloating smirk and snickered. I bought it with my own money, Mark, so don't get all pissy about where it came from. I do make money, you know, even though it's not as much as you. And I also bought the shoes too, if you're wondering. I tried to swallow my anger, but it was difficult. Her long, shapely legs were exposed in the short hemline of the skirt, and the high heels made her calves flex every time she took a step. The dress was low-cut, showing a bit of cleavage. You ready? She asked, slipping her arm in mine. Let's go out on the porch and wait for Jim. My jaw dropped. Jim? I gasped with surprise. What do you mean Jim's going to pick us up and take us there? She said, as if I should have already known, that way you can drink if you want. But what? Why? I sputtered. We can just drive over there. Carol held my gaze and spoke with determination. I already spoke to him, and he's coming over right now. You spoke to him? My God, but why? I wasn't exactly sure if you were going, she said, her blue eyes staring straight at me. You were such a snit at the last event. I wasn't sure if you'd stand me up again. You took Jenny away, and I was worried you might just bail on me. There's no way I was going to miss this event tonight. So, in case you got cold feet, I called Jim, and he said he'd take me. Take you? Was he prepared to take you without me? No, I mean, I didn't want to miss it, Mark, she explained in a reasonable tone. I thought you might try to blow me off and just not go. Jim's a gentleman, and he said he would take me if you didn't show up. So he's on his way over right now. If you want to go, be ready in ten minutes, Mark, or we're leaving without you. Damn it! I shot back, growing more angry by the second. So, you weren't going to wait for me, huh? Well, why don't you and Jim just go without me? Maybe I didn't want to go anyway. Carol's expression grew angry like I'd never seen. Her cheeks turned bright red and smoke seemed to be coming out of her ears. She snorted angrily, stood up, and stomped her way into the kitchen. Do what you want, you asshole, she shot over her shoulder. I could hear Carol pouring herself a glass of wine in the kitchen. I took a deep breath and shrugged, trying to make some sense of this latest change of plans. I went to the bathroom to wash my face and calm down. While I was there, the doorbell rang, and I knew Jim had arrived. Carol must have let him in, and I could hear them talking, probably about me. I couldn't hear what Jim said, but I was angry that he was so involved with us again. When I came down, I saw them chatting. My blood boiled, and I could not hold it in any longer. I told Carol, since you two already plan to go together, leave. Come on, honey, don't behave like that, Carol mumbled, I don't want to go if he's going with us. I wanted to go with my wife, not his friend. I saw Carol stand up and leave. I guess the marriage was over now. She returned later that night and just got in bed. The next morning, Carol was still giving me the cold shoulder, but we did speak about normal things at times, the girl's schedule, household chores, and such. But there was a lack of warmth that was obvious. Work was giving me a hard time as well. My boss had me working late most nights, so I guess I wasn't around as much as I would have liked. One evening, I got off early and came home to find Jim in the kitchen having coffee with Carol. I nearly exploded, but they barely reacted when I came in. 
When I asked him why he was there, he seemed a bit unsure before Carol mentioned they needed some boxes brought down from the attic, and since I wasn't around, she asked him to help. Jim just nodded and told me it was on his way home from work, so it was no problem. I accepted her explanation and went upstairs to shower. When I came down, he was gone. I had another hard week at work. It sucked so much. I was desperate to keep things calm. When I finally got home, somehow Carol seemed to have accepted Jim back into our house. Any complaint I had about that was met with a huge argument. A couple of times when I got home late, I found out Jim had already eaten dinner with my family while I ate the leftovers. Jenny was very excited and told me Jim had given her a new pair of sneakers. Another time, she said he bought her a jacket. Each time she relayed this info to me, she seemed delighted to have him around. Carol did as well. One evening, I got home and found that Carol had fixed some great food. Jim was there again. They were all chatting loudly as I walked in. Carol glanced at me without speaking, almost daring me to make a fuss. When I didn't, they went back to their conversation, ignoring me as I sat down to join them. It was around this time that I began to feel like a third wheel, basically an outsider in my own home. Carol and I were speaking, but barely, and sex was not happening. I couldn't help feeling that Carol really didn't care if I was there or not. If Jim was there when I got home, he acted friendly and asked me about my work. He acted like he wanted to know how things were going, so I replied, not wanting to make a fuss about his presence. But soon, I began to resent how often he was around and how eager my whole family seemed to be in accepting him there. One evening, after a particularly long visit, I took Jim out onto the back patio to have a word with him. I expressed that I was uncomfortable with how much he was around. I told him that if he came over from now on, I'd like a phone call beforehand because it was only polite to call me first. He listened in silence, gazing at me with a strange, disinterested expression. He said, no problem, that he didn't want to cause any problems, and he'd respect my wishes from now on. I thought that was the end of it. Boy, was I wrong. That evening, when Carol and I got into bed, I remembered how she had reacted during dinner, seeming to be in a great mood, chatting and laughing at things Jim said. I also thought about my conversation with Jim. I'd been working late a lot, and Carol and I were not together much anymore. Something inside told me that I needed to reconnect with my lovely wife on a physical level. Since she was in such a good mood, I thought tonight was the night to begin to put our relationship back on track. After a great dinner, I helped my wife clean up. She seemed to be in an unusually good mood. We were speaking normally for a change. Jenny went to bed, and I followed my wife to the bedroom. I began throwing some subtle hints to my wife for sex. I knew she could tell that I was horny, but she didn't respond. She didn't shut me down but wasn't receptive to any of my advances. When she finished cleaning up in the bathroom, she emerged wearing her long flannel nightgown, which was a silent message that she wasn't interested in anything physical. Once she was under the covers, I moved closer and snuggled against her flannel-clad body. My hand landed on her stomach, and I felt her stiffen. She immediately pushed my hand away and turned over on her side, with her back facing me. Normally, I would give up, but I was still upset about having Jim over, and it had been quite a while since we had sex. Just the scent of her hair and the warmth of her body had me hard and aching for release. Jenny was asleep, and it wasn't that late, so I decided to ignore her unspoken rejection and went forward, hoping she'd change her mind. I slid over behind her, held her hips, and began to spoon against her body. Honey, you look so sexy tonight. I really am turned on, I told her softly as I began to push near her body. Not tonight, Mark, when I didn't stop, she repeated, I said, not tonight. I'm tired. Maybe some other time, okay? I was stung by her rejection. It had been weeks since I enjoyed her charms, more than a month. I decided that I wasn't taking no for an answer. Come on, baby, it's been a while. You know how much you turn me on. She pushed my hand off of her and repeated firmly, not tonight. I kept trying to hold her until she spun around and told me in a rather harsh tone of voice, will you stop? I said I was tired, and I meant it. What the hell, Carol? I snapped back. You've been shutting me out for weeks now. What am I, a monk? I'm just tired. 
please don't make a big deal about this, she said, sitting up and throwing the covers back. I gazed down at her angrily. What the hell's going on, Carol? I flipped on the light next to our bed and said, we haven't made love in over a month. You've been distant and mean for weeks. Is there something wrong with you? With me? You may have forgotten, but I'm still your husband, and you have to talk to me. I guess my angry tone and harsh expression finally got through. She turned over and gazed up at me, her blue eyes flashing with anger. You asshole, she snapped. I told you I'm tired, but you don't seem to care a bit about how I feel. I take care of the kids in the house, and I stay home waiting for you. But you never take me out. You never bring me flowers anymore, or even come home on time. Now you want to just screw me, satisfy your filthy pleasure, and go to sleep? Filthy pleasure? I was caught off guard by her bitterness. I drew back from her angry outburst as she sat up and shook her finger in my face. You selfish creep. I've given up so much, and all you want then, Mark, you want some sex? Is that it? Is that what it'll take for you to leave me alone? In one quick motion, Carol pulled her nightgown up to her waist, lay back down with her eyes closed, and spread her legs. Well, she said, glaring at me, don't just sit there with a stupid look on your face. Just put it in. Put your little wiener in me and screw me. That's all you wanted, right? A piece of meat. So get to it and hurry up so I can get some sleep.